Well, I have been, uh, I had been told for almost two years about our next speaker and the books he was working on. And I know that Gene Bodie had worked with him and, uh, uh, doing some reading and suggestions and editing and so forth. And, and when I finally saw the books when they were published and saw how m meaty they were, I just couldn't even imagine how much many man hours and research had gone into it all. And, uh, Jim has come to us from, tell me the city in England. Kings Lynn? Kings Lynn. Kings Lynn in, uh, in, I think you said about an hour and a half from London. from London. Okay. And he spent 24 hours on the plane or in airports getting here. So we really, really appreciate him coming. And I've been really looking forward to this uh, presentation. Jim, when I, when he sent me his bio, it was just like, all the jobs he's had in the church and the experience and so forth, and then to, to finally come out of, out of the church after all that, as some of us know. We are hearing more and more and more about bishops and stake presidents and people who have had those kinds of jobs who are leaving. So I can't, I don't want to take any more time because he has a lot prepared for us, and I will introduce you to Jim Whitefield. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome to the Mormon delusion, where everything is smoke and mirrors and nothing, nothing is as it first seems, or at least as it's first taught in Mormonism. Thank you, Sue, for the kind introduction and thank you to the Foundation for being crazy enough to invite me out here. Don't blame them, they have no idea what they were doing, so what you're about to see is not their fault at all. I'm just a, a crazy man who, like you, uh, discovered things that he'd rather not discover and has had to suffer the consequences during the next... You have to forgive me, my throat's dry. I might have to drink a little as we go along. I've, I've got one right here, so I'll be fine. During the next 95 minutes, we're going to be looking at the lies that underpin polygamy and polyandry. We're going to track the course of one apostle who lied his way through the polygamy years, later became the prophet, and he died as an outlaw on the run from the law, as a fugitive. We're going to cross-examine the Mormon God. And when I talk about God, if it sounds disparaging, please be under understand that it's to do with the Mormon version, which isn't real, and you'll have to find him somewhere else. And then for the last 40 minutes, we're going to ask uh, Joseph Smith to stand up and be counted. And we're going to sequence the events that he claimed in his story against the, the, the truth, but in a manner that you wouldn't have found in Volume 2. It's coming in Volume 4 next year, which is a new volume. Um, and it incorporates um, the, the, the emerging theology as, as it went through. So you'll get a, a picture of what actually happened in Joseph Smith's life that maybe you wouldn't have seen before. And that will culminate in an admission from the church, or at least from BYU, that a whole chunk of the first vision was actually a lie. And that will blow your socks off if you haven't seen that before. Um, so hold on to your knickers and come with me on a journey through time <laughs> to the truth as we sequence the facts against the fiction. In everything that you see this morning, there are no opinions, there are no suppositions, it's just evidence. So don't take any notice of me or what I say or what I claim. Just study the evidence and make your own minds up. It's as simple as that. The evidence will speak for itself. During the presentation, which will be fast and furious, so you'll have to, I speak fast, you'll have to listen quickly or catch up on YouTube afterwards. I'll take questions at the end so we don't uh, run out of time. You want the lights all off? Oh, sorry? You want the lights all off? No. Okay. <laughs> um, if, if, if it makes you happy. <laughs> And I'm easily thrown. <laughs> Where was I? Yeah. If, if, um, <laughs> there should be one question on your minds throughout the presentation. The answer will be clear and obvious at every stage. The question is, could or would any God have ever been involved with this? That's where, that's where it all hinges. It's as simple as that. Now, you've got my bio, my stories on my website, so I'm not going to go into all of that because it would just waste time. But I do need to let you know why and how I came to be here because it is a little different and it sets the scene for exactly what happened to, to bring me here, um, which wasn't a matter of choice. It was a matter of integrity, to be honest. I felt the obligation and, and that's why I'm here. I joined the church in 1960 along with my mother when I was a 14-year-old, basically an atheist. I'd never considered God. Captured by the mission, missionaries who were charismatic, switched off to reality and joined the church. So it was mission, marriage, kids and callings for the next 43 years. During my life, I often felt 
that I didn't believe in God. And I pushed it aside, as we all push different doubts for different things that happened to us aside, in favour of the fiction that I wanted to believe in. The family were all members, and I was strong and faithful most of the time. Um, a few days after 9-11, my first wife died from cancer. They say we know where we were on 9-11. I was in the hospital room. We watched the planes, the second plane fly into the towers, and later that day I had to tell my wife she had days to live rather than months. Um, but we treasured those nine days that I knew thousands of other people didn't have. So I learned that there's always somebody worse off than you are. And so we deal with whatever happens to us. Um, after that, sitting in church alone was very difficult, although her death wouldn't have affected my belief system. I think anybody that allows that to happen hasn't thought things through to begin with. But I just couldn't hang on to this belief in God that I desperately wanted to. And if, if God wasn't real for me, bear in mind this is for me and me alone. With due respect to anybody else to believe in God if you can and will. I, I just can't. It's personal. It's for me. It's my problem. And I was sitting in church and I just couldn't believe. So I spent a whole year that I put aside to try and make the church be true in my head. I, I prayed more. I went to the temple more. I did more of everything. I wasn't slacking these areas. But it just didn't work. And about a year later, I was reading from the Book of Mormon one morning, and my world just caved in on me. Like one of those, is it a bathosphere that goes down into the sea, one of those glass bubble submarines, and in the movies, suddenly the screen cracks, and then it implodes and your life's gone. That happened to me. And I, in the same way that I think it's probably happened to you, perhaps for doctrinal reasons, mine was simply God. And I knew I didn't believe, and I couldn't believe. And I resigned my membership of the church for no other reason than I couldn't believe in God. Ergo, the church could not be true. I had no idea why, and I didn't even think to look. And for the next three years, I just got on with my life and tried to forget the church. I just assumed Joseph Smith to be a good, albeit deluded man, and left it at that. During those three years, I eventually remarried, and then in March 2006, I retired. I'd already given all my books away, so I didn't have any church books. And as I was unpacking, I found, by accident, a 100-year-old booklet by Joseph Fielding Smith, Jr., written in 1905. He became the, he's the one that became the 10th prophet. They easy to get mixed up. And it was about blood atonement and the origins of plural marriage. Essentially, it's a sequence of letters between Smith and Mr. Evans, Second Council, First Presidency, Reorganized Church, Community of Christ, and Evans didn't believe that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. He thought Brigham Young started it because Emma had lied so successfully, even to her own children, that they didn't believe Joseph Smith ever practiced polygamy. Smith gathered affidavits from the various wives that were still alive and family members, and I knew Joseph Smith had about a dozen wives simply from this booklet. Now, in England, I don't know what it's like over here, but everybody believes what they're taught. Nobody questions. Nobody looks outside the church. And nobody knew how many wives Joseph Smith had. I remember it coming up in Sunday school, and somebody said, maybe four, and I thought, clever me, I think he had about 12, I've got the book. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's all I knew. And in a moment of sheer idle curiosity, because it was the first day of retirement, nothing to do, didn't know whether to go play golf, or I didn't know. I thought, well, I'll check on family search and see how many he had. I'd used it before for my own research, and I did a quick check, and I found 33. And I didn't know whether that was right, wrong, or indifferent, and I thought, fair enough. So I was just about, and this is a life-changing moment. I was about to click the mouse on the little cross on the internet to close it forever regarding the church. And I noticed that the woman I was on appeared to have married a man seven months before she married Joseph Smith. I clicked on the man, and his death date was after Joseph Smith. No divorce listed, but that's not untypical in ancestral files. There's often not a divorce. And I thought, this doesn't look right. I know a little bit about the church. I've been around the houses a little bit. And women didn't marry more than one man, as far as I know. But then again, it could have been an error, because there's a lot of errors in family search. Um, well, I thought I'd better check the others. So I took a few minutes to check all the other of the 33 I'd found. I found 11 women had already got husbands when they married Joseph Smith. Now, I knew I wasn't a historian. I've become a bit of an amateur one because of all this research stuff. But I was an analyst, and I was a statistician. And I knew, statistically, that 11 out of 33 wasn't a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> logic and reason but I was still programmed in my mind not to look outside the three years out I would never dream of looking outside the church because that's where all the lies are so I wrote to Jeff Holland apostle who I'd known for 40 years since his mission days in the 1960s and I said look I've left the church he knew but I've just come across this and I simply do not understand it and I wondered if you'd be kind enough to explain it to me 
So Jeff wrote back and he said, there's much that can be said about polyandry, a word I had never heard of before, and much that can't be said because we just don't know. However, I'll have a mutual friend of ours, and that was Ken Johnson, first quorum of 70, who I've known for about 30 years. He's English, happened to be assigned to England at that time. He said, I'll get Ken to call you. He will discuss the situation with you. So that's great. So I got the phone call. But I have now been speaking for about six minutes, and if you know anything about human nature... The mind tends to wander after six minutes. We're not capable of paying attention for too long. So I just want to make sure I've got your attention and you haven't seen anything new yet. So let's just change the screen. And uh, let me make a couple of statements to you about polygamy. Okay? Listen carefully. The church never has, still doesn't, and never will believe in polygamy. And for those of you who didn't quite take that in and thinking, what did he just say? The church has never believed in polygamy. I'll go a stage further and claim that no member of the church has ever practiced polygamy. Not one, ever. That's it on screen, so I'm not going to backtrack on that. Some of you are thinking now, but my ancestors were polygamists. And some of you are thinking, this guy's written a bloody book about it. What's he talking about? He's an idiot. Well, idiots apparently do come from England. Now, those statements... (laughs) Or Australia. (laughs) We come a long way just to prove we're idiots. Those statements are up there for three reasons. The first reason is to grab your attention, which hopefully I've now got. The second reason is because they're both true. One or two of you will know why. The rest of you will have no option but to agree with me in two or three minutes when I explain why they're true. It's a matter of understanding. The third reason is because you can do what you like with words if you know what you're doing. And the church uses this system to fool you. And I'll show you how they do it in a few minutes' time. But first of all, let's just explain these so that you don't throw me out before I finish my time. To understand why they're true, we need to understand relationships and actually what they mean. And the first thing is polygamy. Polygamy, dictionary definition, is the marriage of a man to more than one wife or a husband at one time. You know, a man with two wives or more, a woman with two husbands or more. So you can see clearly immediately why the church doesn't believe in polygamy. It believes in polyandry. Sorry, polygyny doesn't believe in polyandry. That's the other one. Let me put that up for you. Polygyny is not a word we're familiar with or use very often, so when we say polygamy, we really mean a man with more than one wife, but it's not technically correct, so that's my excuse for it being true. Polyandry, the church doesn't believe in. Now, there's something else about that that comes on to the second statement about no member of the church ever practicing polygamy, and the reason that's actually true, nobody ever seems to mention, but you know, I seem to think it is right. The fact is that for a marriage to be polygamous, you'll note those are not just dictionary definitions, they're legal definitions. The word crime doesn't appear. For a marriage to be polygamous, the minister that performs it must have the authority of the state or country in which he lives to perform a polygamous marriage. If he doesn't, it's bigamy. It's illegal. It's a crime. It says so. It's a crime of having two or more wives or husbands at the same time. When polygamy was first introduced into America, it was illegal. I know. I've got a copy of the legislation from each state. When they moved to Utah, people said, oh, it might have been legal there. It wasn't. Utah was owned by Mexico. It was just as illegal in Mexico as it was in Utah. And just because there was nobody in Utah to enforce the law didn't mean they could still practice it because the Mexican government never gave any LDS minister the authority to perform a polygamous marriage. So every marriage was bigamous. After the Hidalgo Treaty, when the US then owned uh, Utah once more, of course it was already illegal and then further laws were enforced to uh, make the situation even worse for everybody. And the only other relationship is adultery. And we could spend a whole session on that. The church did a lot of that as well, but that's not what we're talking about today. So there we are. That, that's why those statements are true, but it was just to wake you up a little bit. So I got the phone call. Elder Johnson phoned me, and after the usual pleasantries, I said, what is the official church position on polyandry? And these are his exact words because I wrote them down. He said, it is absolutely contrary to doctrine. That's a finite, it's a definitive I said, what is the position if I have conclusive proof that Joseph Smith, Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball at least participated in several counts of polyandry? And he said this, those who participated would have to account for it. I said, but that means that theologically, if I'm right, those three forfeit their eternal salvation in terms of Mormon theology. And he said, it doesn't matter. The church is still true. Joseph Smith still saw God and Jesus Christ. And he still translated the Book of Mormon. My assurances are enough. We're friends. I didn't argue with that. Unlike Joseph Smith, who didn't know what time of day it was, let alone when he saw his vision, that was the 8th of September 2006 at 2.25 in the afternoon. (laughs) (coughs) And I wrote them down not to publish them or to tell you people about it. 
I was just trying to get my head around the facts. It was for me personally, I was trying to deal with this church that I loved, despite the fact I couldn't believe in God, therefore a church can be true. And here I was finding out things that were destroying my soul on top of all the other stuff I'd had to deal with. Well, Ken said, send me your evidence. I will send it to the apostles and we'll get you an answer. Well, those of you that had experience with this know very well you don't actually get an answer at the end of the day, but I believed I would get one and I was promised one. And a few months later, he was off to conference, and I asked how things were going. When he got back, he wrote me a note, and he said, the church has asked for more time to look at your material. It's not easy to find or validate information such as this without conducting meticulous research. So I was told that the apostles were conducting meticulous research into my work. I'm not sure I actually believe that, but I'm not at the stage to accuse an apostle of being a liar. 